Welcome. Here we go. <clears throat> happy, happy Saturday. So I love to lecture on Saturdays. It's really my favorite time to lecture. I really started in Santa Barbara lecturing on Saturdays back in 1990. It really is, there's an energy. Saturday is really the original Sabbath. So there is that kind of energy, uh, cosmic kind of energy that we, it's a little easier to tap into sometimes. So I enjoy that uh, because I use every crutch I can get. <laughs> that's really... That's really what it's about for me. <laughs> Just a million little tools and crutches. And I've been doing this for a really, really long time, and I stay as much as I can in that mindset of the beginner. You know, we've all heard of beginner's luck. Beginner's luck is kind of a fascinating psychological phenomenon because really what beginner's luck is is that you win because you don't yet know you're not supposed to. You have not yet accepted all of the odds being against you, so you don't realize till somebody tells you later on about how hard it is, and then beginner's luck is over. You've screwed yourself up. <laughs> and so we're always staying in that beginner's place, and the longer that I teach all of this, and I'm really just teaching myself. I always say thank you for coming while I give myself a good talking to. I just open it up to the public because it seems that some people like to hear me talk to myself and get some benefit from it. But I'm really just always reminding myself. And the longer I do this, the more I just keep going back to simple, simple, simple. That's that Zen mind, beginner's mind thing, where he says, in the expert's mind, there are many, many options, and too many, really. And in the beginner's mind, there's not that many. It's also that Zen thing about the empty rice bowl, the empty teacup, where you have to empty out in order to receive. So we're always just trying to let go of all the complexities that we make up and believe. So I always say, when people come to class, I hope you don't get anything out of this. <laughs> what I want is for you to leave here with less than you came in with. Oh, yeah, I dumped that idea, I dumped that idea, I dumped that idea, and I went back to simple, simple, simple. I'm not very smart. I'm not a very bright person. I only know a couple of things, but those couple of things run the whole universe. So I don't need to know a whole lot of shit. I just need to know a couple of things that rule the whole universe. And so that's basically what we do. We come and go over these things again. Oh, that's right. I made it hard again. I started making it difficult and thinking it was very complicated. And that's, you know, something we'll say, although it's so hard and so, oh, it's so hard and so hard, but it's so hard, it's so hard. No, you've made it hard. I can see you or you've complicated it and made it hard. And we like to make it hard because then we think we're deep. <laughs> I'm a complicated, deep person because I've managed to mess things up so much. So we make it simple. We make it fun. Life is supposed to be fun. That might be news to you, might even upset you, but it's supposed to be fun. So if you're not having fun, get with the program. That's really your issue, is that you think it's not supposed to be fun. Because when I first heard that, I was outraged. <laughs> that was really disturbing to me, <laughs> because it's supposed to be fun, and I've been having very much fun. So now I feel like you're invalidating all my struggle. Yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm invalidating all of your struggle. <laughs> it's really unnecessary. But as Terry Cole Whitaker used to say, it takes a lot of effort to get to effortlessness. What is the effort? The effort is unknotting the mind. The effort is not the physical struggle and the doing this. The effort is in the mental practice because we don't feel like it most of the time. It's not even that we don't know what to do. Is we don't feel like it. It's so much easier to just hold a grudge, you know, or blame or attack. It's just so much easier. So we come here and let go of all of that and play little games. We give little tools and little tips to make the journey fun. So my latest thing, this is my first spring semester, this is my motto, is it's all happening. It's all happening. Now those of you who have been around for a while know that one of the things that we say a lot of times, which is a, it's a very generalized affirmation, is lots can happen. So lots can happen is something that we say when we're struck with terror and we don't know what to do. 
So, because the way that the mind tends to work is we think in black and white either or. We see limited, finite options. So our mind is usually thinking in terms of, I'm either gonna get this job or be homeless. <laughs> right? It's like really pretty black and white usually for us. So we usually just see it's gonna be this way or that way and that's it. So one of the things about, you know, I, w I went through this whole thing recently where, you know how you don't know how you end up somewhere because of the internet? <laughs> like, how did I get there? I, was, I don't even remember what I was looking for anymore, but it wasn't this. <laughs> but anyhow, I, a lot of that happens to me where I end up somewhere. And so I've really been coming full circle over and over again lately back to my roots, back to the beginning. And the, my first real, I would say, spiritual teacher was Robert Schuller who just died recently. He, of course, ran the Crystal Cathedral. And he is really the reason that I'm here. I don't think I would have ever left Pennsylvania if it had not been for that television show. Because every week I would watch that and he would basically bolster your courage. And it, of course, was called the Hour of Power. And what his philosophy was, was possibility thinking. But that possibility thinking was just the offshoot of his mentor, which was um, positive thinking. So it, Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, was really a mentor to Robert Schuller. Now, of course, Ernest Holmes was a mentor to Norman Vincent Peale. Right? So it was that chain effect. Now, what I did not know that I found out, I'm going to be taking this off and putting it on a lot, because I cannot regulate my temperature today. So. Um, what I didn't know until like around the week of Easter, because they had all these religious movies on TCM, and they had the, the movie of Norman Vincent Peale. And what I did not know was that when that book came out, there was an enormous backlash against him from the religious community and the psychiatric community. Because, of course, he was making people well. And we can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> that will never do. And, you know, they felt like he was really oversimplifying things, which he really wasn't if you really sort of delve into, the, into what he was teaching, but they felt like it's an oversimplification. And so ever since that time, it still has this sort of horrific, um, like to talk about positive thinking, people don't want to talk about that. It's like that's something that idiots do like positive thinking, like, you know, oh, your daughter was murdered, well, look on the bright side. Like, that's what people think positive thinking is. That is not what positive thinking is. But that's what people sort of, it's a way to kind of diminish you, that you're a positive thinker. In fact, I remember Deepak Chopra saying on, tele on like Larry King once, he said, positive thinking is one of the most stressful things you can do. <laughs> but that's not true. That's not true at all. Not real positive thinking. And so the, I've had like this full circle thing of like reclaiming so many things that have been diminished by the culture in a lot of ways. And so one of the reasons I think that positive thinking got a bad rap is for the same reason that affirmations got a bad rap, which is because they were so misunderstood in the beginning. And what a lot of us were taught at the beginning too were not good affirmations necessarily, where you were in a situation where you're ready to be homeless, you've been fired from your job, you have no one to help you, and so you're taught that you should say an affirmation like, I am abundant and wealthy. <laughs> well, of course, that's a terrible affirmation because you, don't, you have to believe your own affirmation. If you don't believe it, it's useless. That's why it seems useless. It is useless. That's a terrible affirmation to have. It is too far a jump in consciousness from where you are. An affirmation has to be close enough in consciousness where you are so that you begin to feel soothed and uplifted because they're not magic spells. Prayer itself is completely unnecessary and does nothing in terms of what we've been taught prayer is. This is why Joel Goldsmith you know, goes on and on in, in his books about how and it's, he just beats it into the ground, which is fabulous, about how no prayer of any Christian, Jewish, or New Thought church has ever done anything in the history of mankind. 
meaning God stop this war, God heal this disease, God do this. Those prayers do nothing. Prayer does nothing to God, and God doesn't do anything. But that's really why in New Thought we talk about treatment, because the prayer is not directed at God. The prayer is the treatment that is directed to the self. It does not move anything into alignment with us. It moves us into alignment with infinite possibilities and power. It moves us, not anything out there. It tunes us in. It doesn't change what's being broadcast. It just has us change the channel. We stop watching Channel 4 and complaining bitterly about what they show on Channel 4. Please, God, change what they're showing on Channel 4. I don't like it. It's never going to happen. What happens is you change the channel to channel two and go, oh, right? That's what real prayer does. So affirmation has to be something that actually changes you or it won't do anything. So an affirmation can't be so far from where you are that you don't believe it. So that's why something like lots can happen is a bridging belief where you go from, I'm either going to get this job or be homeless, to, you know what, lots can happen. I don't have to know how, but lots can happen. So we've been saying that for like 10 years when I first discovered that in a little book called The Law of Attraction by Michael Lossier, where he talked about just generalized affirmations like lots can happen. So we all have that. We know that if you're really in a bind and you don't know, you go to lots can happen. But that's still very low level thinking. We want to go way to the next place to it's all happening. It is all happening. That means not later, not eventually, not after this, but it is all happening. Now, where I got that was, and there's wisdom everywhere, was from Lisa Vanderpump's TV show. <laughs> One of the crazy people on her staff has a tattoo on her arm that says, it's all happening. And where she got that from was from the movie Almost Famous. Because the, the character Penny Lane says that several times throughout the movie. When things are working and going well, she and her friends will say, it's all happening. It's all happening. And so this girl on the Elise Vanderpump show has this tattooed on her arm. Talk about an affirmation. This has become like the, the motto by which she lives. And the, the, I don't watch it. I've seen maybe two episodes, but I happened to see the one where she showed her tattoo and she was getting ready to be married and sort of everyone hated her, but everyone hates everyone on those shows, so it's not unusual. <laughs> but she seems like kind of a hated person on that show with a lot of drama around her, but she don't care. It's all happening. Right? And so the, a lot of the season, I guess, was about her getting married. So she was getting married and all this stuff and everything. And basically, all her dreams were coming true. It's all happening. And it's all happening, that's a mindset. We want to set our minds. That's what we do at the beginning meditation. We say, decide how you want to feel when you leave here today. Set your mind now. Decide now. I, I say a lot of times, people in new thought oftentimes are just too wishy-washy. People, it, sort of new thought spiritual people can be very wishy-washy. I hope it works out. Well, we'll see if it's God's will. Where, where the hell did you come from? That's, that's what I left in the Catholic Church. That has nothing to do with new thought. There is no hope in new thought. That's the good news. There is no hope. All hope. There should be a sign over every new thought church that says, abandon hope, all who enter here. <laughs> there is no hope in new thought. There is certainty. But that certainty is about principle and not about what happens. Do you understand that? The certainty is about principle. We know that principle is certain, but we're not certain. Right? Like The principle is what goes up must come down. So I throw a ball up in the air, it's going to come down. That's the principle. But I can't know where it will come down. I may throw it up in the air and a bird will fly by and grab it. Right? I don't know. I cannot control that. But principle, right? so we are certain of principle. We don't hope the principle will work. The principle will work. Right? We don't hope that gravity, hope gravity holds me down today. 
You don't have to hope that gravity will hold you down today. What you have to do is line up with it and set your mind how you will work with gravity today. So that's what we do. So we play all of these fun games of how to keep aligning ourselves again with that law. Keep aligning our conscious. Everything is consciousness. It's consciousness, 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 consciousness. We are, tend to be obsessed with behavioral modification. But I say to people in, in my groups, I'll say, if you look at somebody and you want what they have, it wouldn't do you any good to have what they have. If you want the relationship they have or the health they have or the job they have or any of that, it would do you no good at all because you would mess it up as soon as you got it. What you want is the consciousness that person has. Not the thing they have. What you want is the consciousness in them that allows them to accept that or expect it. And that's all the work that we're doing then is on our consciousness. How do I expand my consciousness? How do I expect more out of life? And that's all the little things we do. All the stuff that really is the beginner stuff that as long as you keep doing, you know, this is the embarrassment sometimes if you've been around for a long time is to watch people who come in and it's new to them and watch them just bam, 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 bam. Oh, yeah, I got a job and I got a relationship and I got a house and I got that. Right? And you're like, well, right? Well, wait till you get to the next class. That's when it all goes away. Because that's when we start teaching you complication. Right? Then you'll think you have to work for it and shit. Right? Instead of just saying, no, -ho, keep the vision board. Just do the vision board. I was listening to a podcast last week of this guy who, um, who was talking about his vision board. And he was, he was interviewing another guy. They're both in, in show business. And so... This, the guy whose podcast it is, at the end of his podcast, he always says to the person, what's your dream gig? Like, what, what is your dream gig? And it's really interesting to see how many people don't really know what it would be. That's, there's two parts to that. One is they don't really know or they're afraid to say it. And both of those are why you're not getting it. <laughs> right? If you don't have the courage to say it, then that right there is why you're not experiencing that. But so it's interesting that people that say, oh, I would like to be a writer on this show or I would like to whatever. So the, the guy who was telling you this week, he, say, he said to him, well, what's your, what's your, and this guy is a writer and he's written TV shows and things and he does some acting too. He said, what's your dream gig? And he said, God, I don't really know. I'm not really sure. I, you know, I don't know. And so the moderator said, well, do you have a dream board? He said, I have a dream board. Do you have a dream board? And he said, I don't really. He said, you know, I'm not that much into that. My boyfriend has one of those and... I mean, it always happens, but I don't have one of those. It's like, well, yeah, why would you want to do something that's working? <laughs> right? It's easier to sneer at his positive thinking and goal setting. <laughs> Idiot. And his pictures. As he goes and gets job after job and feels better every day. And I'm over here on my side of the bed reading books about the end times. <laughs> the financial collapse of Western society. <laughs> so... So the guy who was, whose show it is was talking about, he said, I have a dream board. He said, and every year um, there's a park near where I live, West Hollywood, uh, Plumber Park. And he said, I rent a room, because you can rent rooms in there. He said, I rent a room there, like at the end of every year, and invite you know, certain of my friends, and we do vision boards together. So we, we take a Saturday, and we just spend the day doing our vision boards together. And he said, and I thought it was great, he said, um, I, he said, I noticed this week something from my, he called him dream board, he said, is that I have a picture of all these water bottles. He said, what that represents to me is, and he's a, he's a writer, he said, what that, I've no, I don't, I'm assuming that when you go into these meetings, there's a lot of water bottles, because basically he was saying to him that represented taking a lot of meetings, where he's going in pitching script ideas, and all the people are sitting at these tables with their water bottles. So that's all he needed was a picture of water bottles, and he knew what that meant to him. And so he said, this week I was realizing that I was having all the kinds of meetings I wanted to have. When I went home and looked at my water bottle, I was like, oh, God, I've been having all those kinds of meetings. Because you are impressing this on your subconscious mind. That's the only thing that's ever really happening, is that we are activating our own imagination. 
That's all. All worry is is the negative use of your imagination. Has anyone here worried at all recently <laughs> about anything? I mean, it's just after tax week, so right there, that usually sends your mind to something or other. So all you were doing was using the creative power of the universe to create what you don't want. That's all. I'm just imagining the worst, because that's realistic. That's what we do. None of this freaking positive thinking crap, right, where you think things that make you happy. I understand that you must go to the worst case scenario. Imagine it, live in it a while, <laughs> then hope it doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Instead, of, why don't we just prepare for the best? Um, <laughs> one of the things that I, that I taught people to do recently, because I had heard this at, at actually an Abraham seminar. So the Abraham has what they call Abraham is a channeled group of, of consciousness that's, that's channeled through this woman named Esther Hicks. And so they will do these seminars and they'll have what they call the hot seat where somebody sits and asks questions. And so this guy comes up and he sits down in the hot seat and he says, I don't really have a question, he said, but I wanted to <clears throat> describe an experience I had and thank you. He said, and he'd been studying this stuff for a long time and he said, what I did was about 60 days ago, I decided to actually do all this stuff. Okay? What a concept. Everybody has the books, right? You have the tapes. You've been to the classes. You've been everywhere. And then you go like, should I try some of this? <laughs> Seems really imprudent to just jump in like that after 20 years to start doing this stuff. So he said, I decided I was really going to commit to 30 days of doing this. And to him, what that meant was feeling good. Remember, the better it gets, the better it gets. And the worse it gets, the worse it gets. That's how life works. The better it gets, the better it gets, and the worse it gets, the worse it gets. Why? Because whatever you focus on increases in your awareness. So when things start to get bad and you start letting that take all your attention, it's just going to keep going in that direction. That's one of the laws of the universe. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. As things get worse and you focus on that, it will continue to get worse. If you start to pay attention to what is good, then you will start to move the energy in that direction. So his thing was, I'm going to spend 30 days deliberately cleaning up my consciousness by focusing on things that make me feel good. And so he said, I had several things that I wrote out that I was going to do every day for 30 days. And one of the really significant things that he did, he said, I wrote a thank you letter to you, Abraham, in which I thanked you for all of the things that had happened during the 30 days. And then he talked about what those things were. So he said, I decided that I was going to lose 15 pounds without doing anything. I wasn't going to diet or exercise. I was just going to lose 15 pounds, eating and acting exactly as I had been before. I decided that I was going to be in a fabulous relationship with an amazing woman, and then I just listed like some of her qualities. I decided that I was going to go into a business with my best friend because we'd been talking about it for years, and so I decided that. So he decided all of these things. He wrote them down in the letter, and he said, I read that letter twice a day, every day for 30 days. And while I read it, I imagined myself sitting here in this hot seat reading it to you. He said, now, it was a 30-day experiment, but you know, you didn't come to town in 30 days, so it's actually 60 days later. But here I am, reading the letter to you. And he said, I didn't lose 15 pounds. I lost 17 pounds. <laughs> not doing anything, not exercising, not whatever, just, saying, just reading the letter and doing the, you know, the things to make myself feel good. And just everything basically happened. He was like, and, you know, and what he said was, you know, Abraham talks about, I don't know if they do anymore, but they talked about the grid. And the grid was like the scaffolding of your life. So that's sort of the consciousness that we're building. You know, there's a lot of metaphors in spirituality about your life as a house. You know, Jesus talked about your house is built on rock or your house is built on sand and all of these things. So Abraham used the idea of this grid, which would be like the scaffolding of a house. So your consciousness creates this grid. And then you let the universe fill it in. 
Well, what he had said in his, in his statement, he said, I was used to force filling my grid. <laughs> so he said, I would make shit happen. So I would just look and go, I want that job and work for that company, and then I would make it happen, and then I would get in there, and I would hate the company. It would be a horrible job. Or I would just pick this woman. i go, oh, she's so fabulous. She's the one. And I would start dating her. i go, oh, no, this is a nightmare. So he said, this time, I was not going to force fill my grid. I was just in a place of appreciation and openness, and I stayed very general about things, about what it felt like. So here's what I really want you to remember if you don't remember anything else. When you're designing your life, which you are all the time, think in terms of the word essence. What's the essence of the life you want? When we get married to the form, just like this man said, sometimes it'll make you happy and sometimes it won't. But if you're going for the essence, then this is something Jerry always used to say, who was married to Esther until he passed on. And so he would say, the universe can deliver the essence of all your dreams. So. I'm sure you've experienced this, I've experienced this a lot, where my life feels the way I want it to feel. It does not look the way I wanted it to look. Years ago, when I was lecturing in Palm Springs, there was a woman there who was a, uh, she still lives there, but she was, this was like in 2002 or three or something like that, and she is a singer, and she had just moved to Palm Springs a few years prior to that, and she was a singer, and she was, had been living in Branson and singing in big shows there and starring in musicals there and all this stuff. But she ended up in Palm Springs. She had bought a little house. Her mother moved in with her, her mother who was dying. Um, because <laughs> That's a phrase. Dying. Bob is dying. Because Bob, this, Bob was dying for 25 years. Bob's dying again? OK. So anyhow, her mother's been dying for like a really long time. And so her mother's been living with her for a really long time, which is when you're a grown person and your mother's living with you in your small home. <laughs> right. And so she sings at a little gay bar in Palm Springs. And she sings there like twice a week. And then she does some other gigs along the way. So I start teaching, and she's actually a practitioner in what was at that time the religious science church there. And she would come every week. And after I was there maybe six months or so and talking about all this stuff, she came to me and she said, I just realized I'm living my worst case scenario. <laughs> she said, this is the worst case scenario of everything that I wanted from life, everything that I wanted to do and be and have was the opposite of this. And here I am living in the desert singing at a little game, all this stuff she said, and I'm living my worst case scenario and happier than I've ever been in my life. Because what she'd done is through the shifting of her consciousness, she had created the essence of the life she wanted. In fact, I remember she told me the story about how she had come into New Thought, that she, uh, this is how I remember it anyhow, and so to me that's all that matters. Uh, <laughs> Never let the facts ruin your story, <laughs> OK? Always tell the story the way it feels good to you. So she, she told me that the way that she, and I can't remember if someone introduced her to Ernest Holmes' teachings or something like that. But anyhow, she was, and I can't remember if she was on vacation or if she was, but it seems to me she was on a cruise ship. So I don't know if she was working on the cruise ship or on vacation. And it seems like there were a lot of Russian people there. And she was sort of hanging out with all these Russian people. And so, you know, they were just, you know what you do on a cruise ship? You relax and you party and you drink and you do this and you go to the shows and all this stuff. And she said, finally, she said, one of the Russians said to me, you know, you are really negative. <laughs> and it's like, she said, you know, when the Russians say you're negative, <laughs> you really need to check yourself. <laughs> like, oh my God, I better clean up my act. Like that was her wake up call. The Russians think I'm really negative. <laughs> right? So as soon as she had that, that, you know, waking up of like, I need to change, then somebody gave her a book. That's how it operates. Once your consciousness opens, there it is. You've started to tune in. 
So that's why we always say you go for the essence of the life and don't worry about all of the minute details. And so what this guy was saying was all of these things that happened because he had not force-filled his grid, he had not said it has to look exactly like this and be exactly like this, what he was doing was not even trying to create those things, but simply to get into the feel-good consciousness of it now. That's why we studied, many of us, Neville Goddard, because he's sort of the king of that, putting yourself in that place. I, I posted a, um, a video on my Facebook page the other day of Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike used to come and speak at Terry's church from time to time. And Reverend Ike was really sort of the king of that. And there was, it's a little YouTube video clip of him talking about that idea of acting as if acting as what it means to act as if, and he would talk about, when he was, I mean, people found him outrageous, but he had a lot of amazing teachings, and he would say, the way that you can help the poor is to not be one of them. <laughs> right? It's not going to help the poor people at all if you don't have any cash. What they could use is your cash, <laughs> but you've got to have some in order to give it to them, and so he was one of the first people who talked about going around in the world and aligning yourself with the things that are beyond where you are that you would like to experience. So he would talk about go to you know Rail, Rodeo Drive on Beverly Hills and just window shop. And Abraham, one of the things that Abraham does is they take that to another level with their money game where they will say, put like a $100 bill or a $1,000 bill in your wallet that you're not actually going to spend, but walk around and spend it mentally because you get into the consciousness of that. But so you do that with everything. So whether it's health or whether it's relationships or whether it's peace of mind or anything else, that you are aligning yourself with that. So Reverend Ike would teach people that when you see somebody who's experiencing something that you would like to experience, that instead of getting jealous or instead of going into victim and poor me and why not me or I ruined my life, I should be here by now, that you just look at it and you go, that's for me that aligns you with that experience. That's for me. If that person can experience that, anybody can experience that. That's for me. That you are constantly in your mind moving into that place of possibilities, of limitless thinking. This is why at the beginning we always talk about let go of your limiting beliefs. You're not thinking of them as limiting beliefs, you're thinking of them as facts. This is just a fact. Nobody is hiring right now. That is not a fact. It's a limiting belief. How many of you saw, have seen uh, Carolyn, um, no, Christian Northrup's PBS special that's on now? It's called, it's, I don't know what it's called, because it's based on her book, which is Goddesses Never Age. So it's something like Glorious Women Never Age or something like that. But in this PBS special, she talks about the, how they've studied centenarians, so people who are over 100 years old. And they studied them on seven different continents so that they couldn't say, well, it's because all the people who eat those foods and it's all, so they are vastly different. And so there were certain things that they all had in common. But one of the things that they all had in common was they think future-oriented. That the people who are happy and over 100 have, are future-oriented. How many people who are 50 years old are already winding down? <laughs> All the good stuff's over. But the 100-year-old people, they're future-oriented. So one of the things that she said was, she, like, you'll say to them, oh, your garden looks so great. And they'll say, where do you see it in three years? Right? They are future-oriented. My friend Zan used to talk about a woman who lived where she was growing up in Granada Hills. She said there was a woman down the street who, she said, you would go knock on their door. Let's say it was Mrs. Smith. So you knock on Mrs. Smith's door, and this really, really old, old woman would open the door, and you'd say, is your mother home? <laughs> and then her mother would come out. <laughs> and, like... She's like, I don't even know. She was like 180 years old or something like that. She said, but, and I can't even remember what she planted, but she planted some thing, it, like she, some ground cover that it takes like five years to actually like come to blossom. And she was like, talk about an optimist. This woman's like 800 years old and she's planting a yard that's not going to grow for five years from now. And she said, and she lived to see it. You know, because she's future oriented. Old age is talking about the past. 
talking about the past. Whether it was good or bad, it's the focus on the past. And you know the other thing that 100-year-old people do not like to do? Talk to old people. <laughs> they don't want to talk to old people. They don't want to hear about your ow and your hip and your this and your that. They want to be around somebody that's young, that's vital, that has interests, right? <clears throat> That's what we're talking about, that we don't start taking ourselves out of the game for any reason, that we're thinking in terms of possibilities. We're thinking in terms of what's the next thing? We're enjoying what's happening now, but we're looking forward to the next thing. That's the balance. So I started teaching people at a certain point, write a letter to Jacob. I mean, you don't, you'll never send it. You can if you want to, but you write a letter to Jacob and you predate it for whatever. And then you just read it every day. Oh, Jacob, this happened, and this happened, and, I feel, and what it feels like, what your work feels like, what your relationships feel like, what it feels like to be in your body, how you feel with your health, how you feel in your environment, how you feel in your home. And you read that every day for however long. Why? To make you feel good. Because the greatest magnet for law of attraction is joy. Nothing attracts joy more than joy because it's in alignment with the universe because the universe is joyful. So when you are coming from joy, it is much easier to manifest because you're in alignment with everything that the universe is doing. Do you know that this just really came to me recently. It's been so such a fantastic shift is when you shift into the place of I'm going to receive in order to please the universe. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You are helping out the universe when you receive. Did you know that? <laughs> it pleases the universe when you receive. Don't hit your neighbor, but put your arms out like this. <laughs> and say, I am open to receive the gifts of the universe. I am open to receive the gifts of the universe. What if you did that every morning? First thing out of bed, you go, I'm open to receive the gifts of the universe for your benefit. <laughs> universe, so that you have a good day, I'm going to receive all the things you had to give me. Have you ever tried to give someone something and they won't accept it? How's that feel? Awful. So don't insult the universe. <laughs> I'm open to receive all the gifts of the universe. I'm getting into alignment with the frequency of the universe. Something that I started teaching people to do recently is, I have a little notebook. I call it my abundance journal. My abundance journal. My abundance journal. <laughs> it's a place to focus all of that where you're like a detective, and you start logging all the good things, all the good things. You could call it your It's All Happening journal. And you just start writing down, so-and-so said I had a cute haircut, and so-and-so bought me a cup of coffee. Now, so you get into the habit of writing down everything that's given, but you also write down everything that you give. Because the only way that you know you are abundant is by giving. That's how you know you're abundant, is by giving. Let's read a little of what Joel Goldsmith says about that as he slaps us in the frickin' face, per usual. <laughs> when we receive a check, we may think that it is a demonstration of supply. The check, however, is not our demonstration at all, but the demonstration of the one who wrote it. How many times in spiritual groups and new thought people think that the check that they received is a demonstration of their supply? No, it's not. It's a demonstration of the person that wrote it. That's whose demonstration it is. They're the ones that had the cash. <laughs> right? 
He is the one who has demonstrated supply or he could not have given it. No matter how much we receive, we never demonstrate supply because our demonstration of supply is determined by how much we give, how much unfolds from within our own consciousness and how much is released from within our own being. Many who call themselves Christians have accepted the materialistic view that supply is getting, whereas supply is giving. This is a spiritual law and its violation accounts for the lack and limitation so many people experience. This is also why Joel will a lot of times say, um, and he's talking about a biblical story that says, what have you in the house? That when you're in an experience where you feel lack, you say, what have you in the house to give? You always have something to give. You can't make all of this about money. I've become completely obsessed with true wealth and abundance because I know now for a fact it has nothing, it has little to do with money. I knew this theoretically for a long time. Now I know it for a fact, having gone for years and years and years with almost no money, and then having lived with having abundant supply, I realized, oh yeah, there's no difference. There really is no difference. <laughs> there really is no real difference. After, th there are study after study after study that shows that after your basic needs are met, there's no difference. The difference is, if your basic needs are not being met, if you don't have a bed to sleep in or food to eat or like that, then it makes a difference. But once your basic needs are met, there's no difference. And what that really means is there's no difference in your happiness or your peace at all. So that's why people who like win the lottery, they're happy for I think it's like a month or like a, a year or something and then they go right back to the level of joy they were at before they won the lottery because that's their set point. What we do in our consciousness work is change our set point. That's what consciousness does. It just changes your emotional, mental set point. That's all. We all have a set point. Some of you really have a fabulous set point. I, you're probably not here, though. Like, you would be like, <laughs> would not have been interested in any of this if you had an amazing set point. Right? Those are the people at the beach right now. They're like... But some people do. Some people have, you know, I always think of that movie, As Good As It Gets, you know, with Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt, and where they're in the car, and they're, you know, Helen Hunt and, and Greg are telling these horrible stories, and of course she wants to hear about it, because that's the human mind, is I want to hear what really bonds us together is our misery and struggle and pain, right? That's really such a common thing in life. And so when you're happy, you're all alone. You are on your own, okay? Uh, there's a famous Bette Midler quote where she says, the thing, about, the thing that's difficult about success is finding someone who's truly happy for you. So in our misery, oh, we're so bound by our misery. So she's saying, you know, you, I want to hear your whole story and your terrible story. And she says, you know, that's the thing is everybody has a terrible story of their own. And Jack Nicholson says, no, they don't. There are lots of people whose stories are about picnics by the lake in the summertime, just no one in this car. <laughs> there are people who do not have a terrible, terrible story. They are at the beach. But it doesn't matter if you have a terrible story, you can change your set point. It doesn't matter how bad it's been. This is the great thing. A spirit is not held back by past precedent. There's no... Well, no one's ever done that before, right? We don't need a double-blind study. And it's like, are you willing? Okay, great. Doesn't matter how bad it's been, you can gradually move your set point. And that's where affirmations and positive thinking got a little off was because people went too far. They weren't trying to gradually change their set point. They were trying to go from deep fear, depression, and misery to bliss. That's way too big of an emotional jump to make. You go little by little by little. You go one thought at a time. You have bridging thoughts, like lots can happen, right? Or I don't have to make a decision right this minute. Everything that I need will come to me in the perfect timing and order. Those are very generalized statements that give you a little bit of breathing space. Then you reach for a higher thought than that. Then you reach for a higher thought than that. We're moving a little bit at a time, and we know that that's the 
best, most sustainable kind of growth. Quantum leaps don't last. This is why even like I was talking last week about shows like The Biggest Loser, like that's so hard for people to sustain in real life because they're in a completely false environment where you're working out 150 hours a day and eating 22 calories and watched like a hawk. But also the thing that I heard recently, I heard two things recently that I will just say allegedly. Because <laughs> I don't know if it's really true. Now. But allegedly, somebody who had been on the show had written something about how he, he or she said, well, you know, a week isn't a week on that show. That they say a week like as if every Monday you come and are weighed in it. And they said sometimes to us that week was 15 days or 20 days. So when they're watching the show and you see that somebody lost 10 pounds in what you think is a week, it was maybe 20 or 25 days. And I remember, Jillian Michaels, okay. This is where I actually heard her say this, but still, allegedly. <laughs> where she talked about, this was when she was not on the show, after she was off for a while. And she also was being interviewed on some podcast somewhere. And she said, she said, you know, I was, I'm super lean on that show, she said, because I'm working out with them like X number of hours a day. And she said, most of the time that I was doing that, I was only eating 600 calories a day. Oh. Well, holy shit, Helen. <laughs> 600 calories a day isn't enough for you to nap on, much less to do cardio and shit. So, you know, it's, and she was saying like, you can't sustain that. You can't live your life that way. And that's why we like having this steady, gradual moving our set point of consciousness to, a little more abundance, a little. This is something that Ernest Holmes would say a lot. He says it in, in the Science of Mind textbook. He says it in his live lectures. He'd say it over and over and over again. If next month you feel a little more relaxed, a little freer, a little more optimistic, you are going in the right direction. That is good enough. Not that you have a completely different life and people are going, what happened to you? I didn't even recognize you. Right? Remember this story? I used to tell this story about Wayne Dyer. No, 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 Ram Dass. In fact, this was at oh, this was at the Huntington Beach Church when Peggy Bassett was still alive, and they had Ram Dass come and speak. And we took a trip from the the West Hollywood Religious Science Church to hear Ram Dass speak. And he told all I remember is the is two stories that he told, and one was about him uh, letting go of things, like he was just letting go because he was he was very zen and he was letting everything go and he was putting all this stuff out in the trash, and then how he kept going out to the trash and getting it back. <laughs> Bring him back. <laughs> well, I do need that thing. So he told that story. <laughs> and then the other story that he told was about going to his, like, I don't know, 20th high school reunion. And Ram Dass was a hardcore student. So he had done things where he had, you know, gone to study with the masters of the Far East and had all these gurus and stuff where you would like meditate for 20 hours a day and you, you know, you would fast and you would pray and you would, you know, meet with the master. Because I remember him telling the story of like, all you were supposed to do was, was count your breaths. That was all you did. And you lived like in a monk's cell. And you didn't talk to anybody, and it was silent. And I don't know how if it was like a month long. And you would just go see the teacher once during the day, and they would just have a very short interview. And so maybe you would, you know, have an experience where you go, "Oh my God, Master! You know, I I just shot out of my body and went into the cosmos, and I saw all of my past lives and all of my future lives, and I saw the whole meaning of life." And the teacher would say, "Was it on an in breath or an out breath?" <laughs> because that's all they cared about. Like, you had to be that focused mentally. That So he talked about all these things he'd done in his protestation, all the things that he had done to really let go of his ego and dissolve it and just be totally spiritual and free. And, and so then he goes to his 20th class reunion. He said, person after person after person came up to me and said, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we always want like people to say, oh my God, you're so enlightened. So, but it's the slow, gradual changing of our set point. It's the little things that we do where we decide, I'm not going to worry. Instead, I'm going to do the write the Jacob letter thing, or I'm going to do the vision board, or I'm going to do my affirmations, or I'm going to do something that moves me in the direction of feeling better. I'm not trying to feel better than anyone has ever felt in the history of people. <coughs> what I'm trying to do is not be up on the roof shooting into the crowd. 
Like sometimes that's just what you're going for, okay? <laughs> Hopefully most of the time what you're going for is I want to move to an even more open level of abundance where I don't even notice the difference anymore between the giving and receiving. That's how big it is. It's just like it comes in and it goes out and it comes in and it goes out and it comes in and it goes out and it comes in and it goes out. That's the only thing that, that Joel is always sort of talking about is no hoarding manna. I talked about this last month. What I've been doing very regularly is I turn on hoarders and clean the house. I have almost nothing left. I've never felt so happy and free, though. But I do. I turn on hoarders, and then I just go, I don't need this, and I don't need this, and I don't need this. In fact, last month when I was here talking about that, then Joel came up to me and said, oh, you know, do you want these CDs of talks? I'm like, I just told you I got rid of 100 CDs. <laughs> but, you, but I understood that's exactly what happens. Nature abhors a vacuum. So that, that's the cycle. It's like you just keep getting rid of stuff and it just finds its way in. So that's what I mean. You don't notice anymore. Your abundance isn't about how much shit I've accumulated and have. That's the hoarder's disease, is that people become attached to their stuff. What I've noticed on that show is probably easily 50% or more of those people start hoarding after a divorce. The rest of them, it's like after a death. It's never just like one day people go, I think I'm going to save gum wrappers. <laughs> like some traumatic thing happens. Somebody, somebody's parent dies, a child dies, a spouse dies, but most of them were at, after the divorce. Mom or dad just started hoarding crap. And so what the, all that really basically says is, is that the things that we are not taught in life are coping skills. We are just not taught coping skills. So when something happens, if we don't have coping skills, then we will do whatever in that moment seems to us to soothe us. And a lot of times, it ain't good. That's why there's a 12-step meeting every 20 seconds and every 10 feet. It's because somebody gets a bad idea of how to get through something. Right? Well, let's just up the alcohol and see what happens. What if I ate three cakes in a row? What if I did? Right? So it's that, that we don't have coping skills. And really, what all of these things that we teach are, are coping skills of just normal life, right? Of just getting through every single day because we are bombarded all day long with stimulus. You know, um, years ago, there's a cultural anthropologist named Jennifer James, and I heard a tape of hers like back in the early 90s, and it's way truer now than it was then. But she said that we are so bombarded with stimulus, she said that by the time that you just go from your house to the grocery store, you see more than your grandparents saw in 10 years. Well, it's way worse than that now. I mean, now, if you turn on a news channel, you're not just watching the news guy, you're watching the scrawl over here, and you're reading the thing over here, and there's a picture in the background over there, and there's a mini picture over here, and your mind's going, wah, 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 wah. So we're constantly being bombarded by, I don't know what it's like here, but even in Los Angeles now, a lot of the billboards are televisions and stuff, so there's stuff going on, so there's like, there's just constant bombardment, and most of it is to some degree negative, even if it's positive. Because a lot of times when it's positive, it's about how you should have this. <laughs> you know, this should be your relationship. This is how your body fat should be. This is the gym you should be going to. This is what, like all of this stuff that even is supposed to inspire us a lot of times just makes us feel like crap. So that's why we need like constant coping skills. This is not like a once and for all philosophy. That'd be like saying, I brushed my teeth so great this morning, I'll never have to do it again. <laughs> it's like, you're going to have to do it several times a day if you really want to have all that filth taken off, right? Well, just think about what your mind is chewing on. Like, you're, we're just talking about maybe you ate a hamburger. What kind of filth does your mind chew on that's like, oh, it's the end of the world. Oh, Monsanto's killing us all. I wonder what my children are doing right now. I shouldn't be wearing this. It's probably toxic. I'm going to end up alone in the street, dead. <laughs> like, your mind... <laughs> He's like, we need to sort of brain... This is a true brainwashing. 
we want to really wash our brains. We want to just wash all of that out and say, I'm, this is something that Esther used to say in, uh, that, that Abraham would talk about in the seminars. She'd say, sometimes Esther will get mad and just pound her fist and so say, I can damn well choose my own dominant vibration. <laughs> well, what does that mean? I can choose my own dominant thoughts. I'm not going to let the media or what my neighbor said or what my children are doing or any of that decide my consciousness and attitude today. I'm gonna, that's why I said at the beginning, you must set your mind and keep it set. You set your mind and keep it set. And that means probably bringing it back 100 times a day where you just keep going, oh, that's right, I forgot. Because even the guy who did the, the letter said, in the beginning it was harder. It was harder to remember to do it every day. He said, but once I started doing it, then it got easier. And that's the thing, is the more you do it, it just becomes a habit. This is what we have to get. We have to stop creating monsters and then fighting them. This is an amazing thing that humankind has done since the dawn of man. We create a monster, then we fight it. So we created a Satan, then we spent time fighting it. So then New Thought just took that and said, oh no, it's an ego, and then we fought that. But neither one of those things exists, so why talk about them? There's no such thing as the ego, there's no such thing as the devil, there's no such thing as demons or boogeymen. We make all that up, then we fight it. So once you let go of the thought that, oh, well, that's just the ego. No, it's just an old habitual thought. It's not even new, right? It's an old thought. This is the same thing. I used to tell the story about my old roommate when I was living, uh, this was like in the 80s, late 80s, and uh, she, her parents were both psychiatrists, so she was very aware. You know, she was extremely aware. But she was also an artist, so she was a dancer, and she had sort of the artist temperament. Love, love, love her. And so when she, uh, when I first moved in with her, she had some of her old diaries from when she was a teenager. And so she was reading them to me. And the best one, I never forgot this. She was probably like 13 or 14 or something like that. And the line was, he doesn't love me. No one does. I'm doomed. Only teenager would say, I'm doomed. I'm as doomed as doomed can be. So, <laughs> so it's like that feeling is like then you could, so you can have that at 13 and then realize, oh yeah, I still have that at 54. Where it's like it's not even a new thought. It's like just an old, habitual, stupid thought where you can just go, oh, you again? Welcome, have a seat, pull up a chair but you're not getting the spotlight or the microphone, right? I'm not gonna try to get rid of you because you're not a thing. You're just an old echo of something from the past. This is the thing, is we don't try to get rid of anything. We accept everything, but we turn up something else. That's all, we just turn up something else. Instead of focusing, how am I gonna get rid of this fear? You're not. The more you focus on it, the stronger it will become. Instead, this is what, why Ernest Holmes would talk about, that you simply take a fear thought or a negative thought and you neutralize it with an opposing thought. That's what an affirmation does. It neutralizes the original thought with an opposite thought. So you go from, these are the, this is, I, I used to for years. And this is why you have to understand what a big liar you are. Just breathe that in. I'm a liar. <sighs> I cannot trust myself. I'm a big liar. Um, because we, we tell ourselves terrifying stories oftentimes that are not true. Thank you, John. So one of the things that I used to say all the time was, it's the worst it's ever been. I go, oh, it's the worst it has ever been. And I would say that kind of around the same time of year. It was in August, and it would be based basically on my income. So I was at that time only lecturing in Santa Barbara, and in August, Santa Barbara just empties out. Everybody goes away, and it is filled by tourists. But tourists aren't looking for, where's the weird spiritual guy? I'd like to go to a class. 
that's not happening. So in August, there were not very many people there, and so my finances would take a dive. And I got in the habit of telling my friend Zan, again, it's really, at first I would gear up and gird my loins for August, right? You're preparing yourself for bad times because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what all new thought is, is prepare for the worst, right? How could I have been teaching this shit and doing the exact opposite of everything I know, which is always prepare for the best. Expect the best, prepare for the best, and just be ready for the best. But no, I would get ready for the worst, so I would get ready for, oh, August is coming. So then August would come, and then I would, all of the weeks of August, I would say to Zan, it's bad, but this year it's the worst it has ever been. <laughs> and then finally, after I'd moved to San Diego, I looked back, and I had all the figures and stuff, and I was like, well, it's almost to the penny the same every single August. But I keep saying every August that it's worse than the one before because I have more practice. I'm better at this now. <laughs> right? You're better at being afraid after a while. You're better at being angry after a while because you've been practicing a lot. So I had just gone to this place of it's the worst it's ever been. And then I realized, again, maybe I should do this stuff I'm teaching. <laughs> maybe I should actually neutralize that thought. So I immediately went into that place of it's the best it's ever been. And then here's what you have to do. And this is the important thing. And this is why I talked about the, the abundance journal is you we, the idea here is, where's your proof? Where's your proof? Your mind will validate anything. So where's your proof? <laughs> I say, I could sit out on my patio and go either way. So I can just go look over here and say, God, I've just wasted my whole stupid life. I have never been in really in a relationship. I have no children. I've saved no money. I didn't reach hardly any of my goals. I'm, you know, this is not the life I want to be living. I don't own anything. My parents are dead. My family lives a million miles away. My life sucks. Then I can look over here and go, so many of my dreams have come true. I love what I'm doing. I can't believe I'm this healthy. I love going to San Diego and going to Santa Barbara. I can't believe I'm this happy. I love my home. And nothing has changed in either one of those stories. It's just how I decide to tell it, because I will gather the evidence either way. I will gather evidence either way and validate it. So where's your proof? So if you go into... It's all happening. Now, where's your proof? Start to gather proof that it's the best it's ever been. Your mind is here to prove that you are right about whatever you believe. This is, you know, that wonderful book, so simple, by Claude Bristol called The Magic of Believing. There are two people who, Phyllis Diller's the reason that I know about that book, is because she would talk all the time about the reason that she started her career was because of reading Claude Bristol's book, The Magic of Believing. And you know who else always recommended that book? Liberace. Liberace and Phyllis Diller on the map because of The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol. And it really is a very simple book. And basically what it says is that he had done a study of all of the philosophies and religions of the world. So he'd you know, Catholicism and Protestantism and Judaism and New Thought and Christian Science and all of it. And he said, the only thing that mattered was that the person believed it. It didn't matter if they believed in a horseshoe or a lucky rabbit's foot or what, that what activated their success was what they believed. Well, that's New Thought, is that your consciousness is everything. So what you believe, you then make manifest. So it's an it's a amazing little book that is like, if you get it, if you should happen to get it, just realize like when it was written. So a lot of the language and stuff is weird and you have to sort of take certain things with a grain of salt. Like there's a whole chapter about, you know, like Florence Nightingale and Joan of Arc and stuff like that because he basically says, this is so foolproof, it will even work for women. So that's how old this book is. So, so you sort of get the mentality. This is a little bit backward. But that was perfect for Phyllis Diller because she was starting in the very early 60s and she already had like five or six children and was in her late 30s or 40s when she started. And so she needed something that would say, 
you know, you have no business being in show business. You have no connections. You're not, you know, beautiful. You're not this, you, all of this stuff. But what you do have to do is believe in yourself. And that's really what it is, that it actually is a belief in yourself. And more and more, what I've realized is that that's just freaking everything. It really is. Every, I just think almost everything comes down to confidence. Just confidence. Just confidence, confidence, confidence. Just that itself. If anything shakes your confidence, that's the thing you have to address right there. Because once you get your confidence back, you're golden, basically, right? But your confidence cannot be rooted in the physical world. It can't be rooted in what you look like or what you own or even what your talent is. It has to be that place of, I'm stupid and untalented and I'm going to win. <laughs> like where you just don't even care about the facts anymore. This was, I, I don't know if I, t have I talked already past the? No, but I'm Cut it down. Well, I'll tell this really fast. <laughs> I talked about this last time I was here, I think, where uh, Lena Dunham and a bunch of people were on uh, a late night show and they were all basically saying we are completely, deeply, irreparably wounded and messed up and all our dreams are coming true. <laughs> I mean, they were almost playing like top this. This is how wounded I am. This is how horrible my, like I have this OCD and I have this counting thing and I have this, 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 this. And I'm in a fabulous relationship and I'm a millionaire, I'm writing movies and I'm on this TV show and my family's great and all this stuff because they just have confidence in spite of all this. They're not like, because I'm so fabulous and perfect, I've achieved all these things. They're like, oh no, I'm a mess. Like way worse mess than you are. No, you're not. I'm a way worse mess than you are. The point is, they don't let it stop them, where there's somebody else who just a little zit right here will be like, no, I can't go. <laughs> Everyone will laugh. They're going to laugh at you. Like, uh, we'll just stop for that. And somebody else is like, eh, who cares? In fact, one of the women who was on, on that uh, dais, I saw her in a documentary that's on HBO right now about comedians, about do comedians have to be miserable to be funny? And she's in this, and she's so funny because she said, I've learned, because she was in a mental institution for a while, and she said, I've like learned to tell that to people, and people like relate to that, and it, it, instead of trying to cover over that, it's part of what has made me popular in a way. And she said, I've even told stories, she said, where one of the horrors of my life, she said, was I accidentally sort of killed my dog. Because she said he had, there was like a, I didn't fully understand it, but he was, he had something wrong with him. And so there was something that she would have to move from the back porch for him to go down. And she said that she had forgotten to move it. And so he just jackknifed out and died. So she said it was horrible. And she said, but then I, I mentioned it in my comedy act. You know, after some time had passed and I had kind of, you know, dealt with it. She said I would talk about it. And she said, now, she said, people, it sets them free. She said, I'll be saying it. And as I'm going off, people will go, I sat on my rabbit. <laughs> Like, like how they all killed their pets and shit. Like, oh my God. <laughs> but it is that thing of the principal doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care what your talents are or your lack of talents are or how wounded you are or anything else. It just cares about what you're activating right now. Okay? So now we can stop the CD. The one thing that I wanted to, um, so we'll do this just, and then I'll sort of wind up, is this idea about your life as a house. And as you're thinking about the essence of the house that you're building, that what is most important, of course, is your foundation. So I'm going to go over, this is what I call a spiritual cheat sheet. I'm going to go over this fast. But then what I'm going to do is I will post it on my Facebook page so that you can look at it. But it's a spiritual cheat sheet. To me, these are the four pillars of the foundation of the spiritual life, where you can look and see what the issue is. This is not all-encompassing, and I made this up because this is my experience. <laughs> but to me, this is where, if you're having any issues, you can sort of look at the areas of your life. To me, the four issues are think whether something is about, whether it's a love issue, a mental law issue, a grace issue, or an action issue. And those, to me, are the four pillars or the four walls of the foundation of your spiritual life. So is this a love issue? 
So this is sort of the checklist I have. Do I need to forgive myself or another? Am I closing my heart off? Am I indulging in attack thoughts? Am I being defensive in order to protect my heart or feelings? Am I busy strategizing rather than being present? Am I withholding love or approval from someone close to me or from myself? Am I not being loving to myself and am thinking in terms of win-lose rather than win-win? <clears throat> am I coming from kindness and walking in love? Or is it a mental issue? Am I being sloppy in my thinking and speaking? Am I not taking responsibility for what I focus on and am doing with my energy and consciousness? Have I fallen back into limited fearful thinking and old negative mental habits? Am I calling limited thinking facts and am defending those limitations? Am I hanging out in hope and superstitious religious thinking or waiting for someone to save me? Am I being wishy-washy, not making decisions, not asking for what I want, or, or am I playing a helpless victim? <clears throat> is this a grace issue? Am I thinking that I know what is best for myself and everyone else, that I have the answer and need things to turn out a certain way in order for me to be happy? If I am doing my part and yet I am feeling frustrated, impatient, tormented, etc., even though I have done my part of the love walk and have done my mental law work, then it's definitely time to come from non-attachment and surrender fully to grace. Have I truly consulted a higher authority? Is this an action issue? Knowing the problem and the answer is not the same thing as activating the answer through doing the work. Knowing about the gym is different than going and working out. Am I not doing what I know to do? Here's a big one. Am I being consistent in my efforts or are they sporadic? Our lives are most changed by the things we do every day, not once in a while. <clears throat> Grace is about surrender to the Holy Spirit, so that is an action. So to me, that's the foundation. So my foundation is good because I am always sort of checking on those things and working on those things to some degree to make the, sure the foundation is good. But my house was kind of crappy, and I had filled it with a lot of junk. So recently, we just tore it down. We just tore down the house, and that's been my experience for the last six months of undoing. Undoing a lot of religious thinking, undoing even what I think of as a lot of spiritual thinking, letting go of all those beliefs in the ego and all of that stuff. We just tore all that stuff down. So now we're rebuilding the house. Now here's the other show I got obsessed with other than hoarders. <laughs> tiny houses. Have you seen the tiny house shows? Oh my God, Becky, the tiny house shows. Okay, so <laughs> there's two different shows that I know of. One is Tiny House Nation. And then the other one is like, I don't know, something else. But basically what it is, is it, and to, a tiny house is more or less under 500 feet, 500 square feet. So, but they can be hot and they can, whatever. So what they do on these shows is, in one of them in particular, they actually design the houses based on the person who's gonna live in it, right? So what they do is, and see, now, when years ago, when the earth was cooling, no, not that long ago, <laughs> more recently than that, when I first started speaking here, when we were at the old bowling alley over, over there. So some of you don't remember those days, but way over there, when they were looking for a new space. And I had just written my book, Invocations. So Guy, who was one of the practitioners, had asked me to write a prayer treatment for the new space. And they had a vision board, and then they asked me to write a prayer treatment to post on the vision board about creating the new space. And the phrase that I used in that, this is how, you know, that whole one mind thing, was the divine architect. And Guy said, that's so funny, because of course Guy was becoming a Freemason. And he said, that's what the Freemasons call God, the divine architect. And you see all the symbology of, you know, the compass and the pens and all that stuff, that's all Freemasonry of the divine architect, the cosmic architect. So. Your life, then, is designed by you and the divine architect. Now, what happens with these tiny houses is, is the person meets with them and tells them the essence of what the house needs to be. But they don't particularly design it themselves. 
They say, this is what I do. I do hang gliding, or I work from home, and so I need an office. Some people need almost no kitchen at all. Some people need the kitchen to be the biggest room. Some people, so all of these things go into their meeting with this designer and architect. So the one that I remember that was the most, and there, it's amazing what they do with tiny, tiny, tiny little spaces where they can do the most freaking amazing shit you've ever seen in your life. And some of it, though, is just cute. So some of it is amazing. I remember Lily Toblin when she played that housewife. She would say, there are some things you can make so cleverly that it is virtually impossible to tell if you have any talent or not. <laughs> so some of the things in these houses are so clever. Like, it's so amazing. And then some things are just, like, cute and cool. So there was this young couple who they were so sports-oriented, and everything was about biking and hiking and this and that. And so for the most part, these tiny houses, you sleep in a loft, which is just like it's just a flat loft, and then there's a mattress up there. And so, you know, there's all different clever ways whether they build staircases or whatever. But for this athletic couple, they built a climbing wall. <laughs> it was so amazing. You know those little, well, that's how they would get up into their loft at night. So, but, but they didn't ask for that. They didn't say, I want a climbing wall. They said, this is the essence of who we are. This is the essence of what the house, sh these are the needs it should meet. This is what we like to do. There should be storage for this. We don't care about that, all of this. So they go over the essence of the house, and then the designer designs the house. And then they're surprised when they move in. So this is what we're talking about. This is what your visioning is. Your visioning is the essence of the life that serves me as me, not the micromanaging of what should happen. Right? It will feel like this. It will feel like that. That's why most people who are in long-term happy relationships get that when we talk about this because they're like, I would never have written you down on a piece of paper. <laughs> You know, like we were taught to write someone down on a piece, like you're not the person I've written down on a piece of paper. You're perfect for me and I adore you, but you're, that's, the, I would have thought something else, right? But you are the essence of this wonderful relationship. But I would have said, you know, you were taller, <laughs> right? Or whatever. So, th so they're revealed. The reveal is then, here's the designer. So that's why you relax then. We get tense in our visioning because we're trying to micromanage. And when you try to micromanage, now you're trying to figure out how the hell would that happen? And how is not your part? We are on a need to know basis. The universe has us on a need to know. But will you need to know some things? Yes. You will know them when you need to know them. <laughs> will you need to do things? Yes. You will be told when you need to do it. If you are given too much information up front, you have time to fuck it up <laughs> and ruin it. So you're told just enough to get you to the next step. Right? Just, and that's why I always say, I am Jesus, semi-retired executive secretary on a need-to-know basis. <laughs> that's what I do. That's who I am. I just go wherever I'm sent. It's perfect for my particular set of quirks and weirdnesses to do what I do. And I get the essence of what I want. And then you fine tune. This is the thing. Once the people move into the house, then they'll go back maybe a week later or something and they'll say, it's perfect and we love it, but we've adjusted this and we've adjusted that. And so you're always going to be adjusting. It's, you're never going to be finished with anything. So stop trying to get to the end. It doesn't exist. The end that you're trying to get to doesn't exist. Do you know that in life you could achieve every single dream and goal that you have and just be the biggest success ever and have had a terrible life if you did not enjoy the journey. You could, on the other hand, get to the end of this life having achieved not one stinking thing that you set out to do and having everything you touch turn to shit and be very happy if you enjoyed the process. It's amazing. If you can just enjoy step A, step B, step C, step D, but we are always so trying to get to the end, 
But you know the end is just the start of something else. So what's the point of rushing? We got to get finished. I don't know if people say this in other places, but in Pennsylvania, and I don't even know if anyone said it outside of my family, but my parents were famous for saying, we have to go so we can get back. <laughs> Why are we going? We're already here. If this is our final destination, we're here. What is the point in going so we can get back? I don't understand anything. All right. Okay, let's do a meditation where we just do the process. So once again, I invite you to close your eyes, take a nice deep breath, and maybe, Joel, play track 12. A little travel in music. So once again, just take, close your eyes, take a nice deep breath, and relax. Relax, relax, relax. And let us move a year into the future. So that we are in April 2016. So perhaps you imagine yourself here, at home, in a new home. <coughs> it's for you to decide for yourself What's the essence that you want to have unfold in the next 12 months? Be there now with somebody that you care about, whether it's a friend or a family member or a mate, but someone who really loves and supports you. It could even just be your spirit guide some angel or being of light. And you are telling them now how happy and grateful you are. So tell them what your life feels like now. The essence of your health, the essence of of your abundance and finances, the essence of your work and play, the essence of your relationships. Tell them. Let go of how. Congratulations, their enthusiasm. Tell them how beautifully and simply it all unfolded. And within your own mind, be opening your arms again to the universe and saying, I am open to receive even more gifts. I have more than enough to share and to spare. I am willing and happy to be a conduit through which the bounty of the universe flows. And I still have many things to look forward to. More dreams, more visions, happy and contented in my now, and looking forward to the future. And know that anything within you that is unlike this, any resistance, any negativity, any fear, right now in this moment just dissolves with 
without effort. You are so ready to thrive. Your house, which is your life, is the essence of all your dreams coming true. present moment, breathing in the peace of God, and once again checking to see how open are you to receive, to have this weekend unfold in joyous and wonderful ways as you begin to notice more than ever all the good every compliment that is given and received, every time that somebody lets you in line in front of them, someone smiles at you, someone buys you a cup of coffee, someone calls to check on you, each one of these is part of the gifts of the universe. There's nothing that you need to do but receive them. No one prays for the sun to come up in the morning. No one prays for the flowers to bloom. No one prays for the sky to be blue. Everything is done in a perfect natural order, and that includes your life. Expect the abundance. Expect greater health and aliveness and vitality. Expect more harmony in all your relationships. Expect more joy in your work. Expect advancement. Expect that your home is supportive and loving and easily paid for. as part of this universal flow, we are willing to give, give, give. To give of our time and our energy and our resources in the ways that work for us, not from sacrifice, not from deprivation, never from guilt. We are happy, joyous givers and grateful, enthusiastic receivers. Neither one is dominant. We breathe in and breathe out. It is not better to give than to receive any more than it is better to exhale than to inhale. We let our lives fall into the natural rhythm. Receiving, giving, giving, receiving, receiving, giving, giving, receiving. All from an abundant, limitless source. We surrender now to this infinite good, offering our hands and our feet and our voices, asking the divine presence within us, where would you have us go? What would you have us do and say and to whom? We remember now as always the way that we will know love and the way that we will feel love is by this divine love moving through us to the world around us. For this we are thankful, and together we all say, Amen. You might want to stretch a little bit. Okay, so I will post, I'll post like a little photo thing of that on my Facebook page. I have a public Facebook page. I also have a private Facebook page, but don't try to friend me on there. I've actually deleted all of my friends, except for my family in Pennsylvania, because I kind of don't like Facebook to begin with. But it keeps me in touch with my family. And so I have a public Facebook page for my work. And so I try to post like little inspiring things. And we even have a day of the week where you can um, post initials for people for prayer treatment and all kinds of stuff like that. But I will post this particular cheat sheet, this spiritual cheat sheet of the four pillars um, later today when I get home. 
uh, I'll post that, and so that'll be on there if you want that. But it also has links to my website and where you can get you know, recordings, and today's CD will be available in the bookstore afterwards, and books that I recommend, all that kind of stuff is on the website. And I'm here the whatever Saturday, is this the third Saturday? I'm here the third Saturday of every month now, so thank you for coming, spread the word, have a glorious month, and we'll see you in May. <laughs>